Hey everyone, it's Berm, and this is Level Zero Networking. In this video, we'll be going over how to set up high availability in ViOS. While this isn't necessarily going to be used in a home environment, it still could be. Having high availability doesn't necessarily mean having more than one provider. It just means having the ability for one router to go down while maintaining network connectivity. For this lab, we'll be using ViOS 1.4.1 LTS. I'm using this version since this is a stable version. As you can see, we'll have two ViOS routers. Router 1 will be going to ISP1, and Router 2 will be going to ISP2. The connectivity to the LAN will be VRRP from the routers to a switch. This will allow for LAN traffic to get to the gateway no matter which router is the primary. In configuration mode, we'll start by configuring the link to the users. For this, I'll be configuring ETH4. Router 1 is going to be 192.168.50.2, and it will be in a slash 24. Under VRRP group HA1, we'll be setting the address. This will be the address used as the gateway going toward the clients. The hello source address will be used to communicate with the other router. It will send hello packets to router 2, so that router 2 knows it is still online. Peer address is the address of router 2. We'll be configuring ETH4 as it's the interface going toward the clients. On your device, this interface name may be different. Now here, priority two is just telling the device, I want router one to be the master. VRID is just setting an ID for this VRRP group. Quick side note, if you don't want the router failing back automatically, you can add no preempt to the HA. If you choose to add no preempt to the configuration, you will turn off automatic failback. What that means is that when the router fails over, it will not automatically fail back to the primary router when it is available again. Lastly, we'll go ahead and create a sync group for VRRP. This is going to allow for the routers to track connectivity using the VRRP config we just put in. We're gonna name the sync group sync1 and then add a member. The member is the VRRP group we created just a minute ago. We only have one, but we could add more than one here if we needed or wanted. Since router one is done with that part, we'll commit and save. Now let's go to router two and do the same thing. The interface address on router 2 will be dot .3 instead of dot .2, but will be in the same slash 24. Now onto the HA config for router 2. You'll notice that the source address and peer address have flipped. The source address has changed to this device, which was the peer address on router 1, and the peer address has changed to the source address on router 1. One thing that hasn't changed though is the address. This is because this address is shared between the two devices. One more change we're making is the priority. I want router two to be the secondary instead of the master, so we're making the priority 100. We'll go ahead and add the sync group here as well. Since router two is done with the VRRP portion, we'll commit and save it as well. We can now verify that VRRP is working by using the command show VRRP. Since we're in configuration mode, we'll be using run in front of the command. The output from show VRRP tells us that it's running on group HA1 and is using ETH4. We can also see the VRID we configured. The state is backup, and it has a priority of 100. It is in the backup state because router one has a priority of 200. Over on router one, we can see the state is set to master with a priority of 200. If we go back to GNS3, we can see how it fails over. I'm going to suspend the link on router one. Now on router one, we can see the state has changed default, and that's because we suspended the link. Over on router two, we can see the state has changed to master. I'll head back over to GNS3 and re-enable the link. On router two, we can see it has immediately gone back to a backup state. And router one is now back in the master state. Now that the LAN is configured, we'll go ahead and take care of the WAN portion. I've already configured the ISP portion of the lab, so we'll go straight into the router one config. The first thing we want to do is configure our interfaces. ETH0 is going to be to the provider, and ETH1 is going to be the connection to router 2. Now, let's move on to the routing portion. I'm going to be configuring BGP for this lab, but you could also just use a static route if you'd like. Before we configure BGP though, we'll need a prefix list and a route map. Our first prefix list is going to permit only a quad 0, or a default route. The next prefix list is going to be advertising our internal network to the ISP to route traffic back. This route map will be used to advertise our internal, publicly accessible network to the provider. In our lab, this will be a workstation with the IP, but in a normal environment, it would be a layer 3 device. 
This will allow for my public IP block to be routed to my internal network through my transport routers. After we permit sending the network we want, we will block all other exports. We do this so that we don't inadvertently send networks we don't wish to advertise to the provider. This route map from ISP1 is going to be used with the prefix list quad zero to accept only a default route from the provider. Let's go ahead and move to the eBGP portion of the config. This is going to be used for talking to the provider. The first thing we'll do is set our system AS number or our autonomous system number. Then we're going to redistribute connected routes. This will be used for failover routing between router one and router two. And will also be used to send our internal network to the ISP. Now, before we set up the actual neighbor, we're going to configure BFD. By default, BGP can take a few minutes to fail over. BFD or bidirectional forwarding will allow for a faster failover of BGP by constantly sending packets to detect network connectivity. The multiplier is going to allow us to miss three packets before the link is considered down. We'll be transmitting a packet every 200 milliseconds instead of the standard 1000. The last line will tell the router we're expecting a packet from the ISP every 200 milliseconds. This is a very aggressive BFD and should be tweaked for what works for you. Now let's configure our ISP neighbor. In this case, our neighbor is going to be 10.100.1.1. Under this hierarchy, we'll be setting the import and export statements. These will be our route maps. They determine what we send and receive from our peer. We're going to be setting our remote AS, and that's the AS assigned to the ISP. Our local AS is what the ISP is expecting from us, and is what we configured earlier in the system AS. In a real-world environment, you may want to specify a password for your BGP connection. To do this, use the password option under the BGP neighbor. Now, we'll go ahead and set up the IBGP to the other router. This is going to be used for failover routing. Router 1 is going to be our preferred path even if the link downstream fails. Once the connectivity to the router 1 fails, then the ISP on router 2 will be used. The first thing we'll need is a prefix list and a route map in order to export our route. For this route map, we'll be using the previously created prefix list of quad zero. In this lab, we're simulating that ISP1 has the better connectivity and higher bandwidth to the internet. So in order to utilize this link, we're altering the local preference of ISP1 to 200 and then advertising it over to router two. This will allow us to continue to utilize the circuit we want even if VRRP fails over. The default local preference for BGP is 100. By making this 200, we're telling router two to use our quad zero instead of the ISP. Lastly, we're adding a rule 100 to the route map so we can send all other routes to router two without a local preference attached. This will allow for failover of other services. Just like with the ISP, we need to set up the BGP neighbor. We'll be adding the route map we just created to the export. I'm also going to add the remote AS of 65002. Finally, we're going to add the command next hop self to the neighbor. This is going to tell our neighbor that it needs to send routes received from us back to us. You don't need this in eBGP. However, in iBGP, you need to specify next hop self. Let's commit and save router one and then move on to router two. Just like on router one, we need to configure the WAN on router two. We'll start with the interfaces again. ETH0 is going to be our ISP and ETH1 will be the interconnect between router one and router two. Again, the prefix list quad zero is so that we receive only a quad zero from our ISP. We'll also be creating a prefix list for our internal network again. Just like on router one, we'll be advertising our internal network to the ISP and then denying all other exports. We're going to be only accepting the default route from our ISP. Now onto the routing for router two. Our system AS is going to be 65002, just like router one. And again, we'll be redistributing connected routes. Let's go ahead and add the BFT profile to router two. Just like with router one, we'll be adding the import and export for filtering routes. Our remote AS will change going toward this ISP though. Since it's a different ISP, it'll have a different AS. Lastly, on the ISP portion, we'll add the BFD profile. Now that the ISP is set up, let's move to the IBGP connection. We won't add a route map here as we want router one to keep its default route from the ISP as the primary route. By not adding an import or export statement, we're allowing everything. Since router two is done, let's go ahead and commit and save it as well. To verify that we've established BGP, 
We just need to do show BGP summary. Now that we've verified BGP is up and running, let's go ahead and put in a basic firewall filter. These commands are going to be input on router two and router one. So I'll be sending commands to all sessions utilizing my command window. Initially, we're setting a default action to drop all traffic. Rule 10 is going to allow return traffic back into our network. And rule 20 is going to allow all traffic from inside our network out. Now let's go ahead and commit and save that. And let's run a test. For this test, I'm going to be doing an SSH session to the ISP1 router on the external interface. So the traffic is going to go from the workstation to the LAN switch, originally to router 1, and then up to ISP1. We're going to fail it over, and then it's going to go to router 2, to ISP2, to the internet, and then back down to ISP1. The reason we're going to do an SSH session is so that we can show the TCP connection still exists after the failover. All right, so let's go ahead and log in. As you can see, I have a connection to the ISP1 router. The 172.19.0.211 is my internal network IP. Now let's go ahead and suspend the link. And as you can see, the connection dropped for just a moment and is back. In this scenario I've set up, all the traffic should fail over and not need to be reconnected. However, if you're not advertising your internal subnet to the ISP and are instead using NAT, you will need to reconnect TCP connections due to the external IP address. Well, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed the content or found it useful, please go ahead and drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also, as usual, feel free to leave any feedback, questions, or suggestions in the comments below.